Okay, it's a little bit after half past two and um, we will start. Very welcome to, um, to this webinar uh, with the title, How to Validate and Recognize Prior Informal and Non-Formal Learning. Um, my name is Anders Alstrand and I work as an analyst at the Swedish Council for Higher Education. And uh, I will be your host for, for the next one and a half hour. Okay, sorry about this, I've had problems with, fine. Um, in this webinar, we will hear different voices on the topic on how to validate. And we will also present a draft um, assessment template uh, for RPL for higher education institutions. And um, here you see the, um, see the program. Before we um, continue with the webinar, we will ask you just a quick poll question. Um, we would like to know if you did take part in the first webinar we had in this series, um, uh, webinar uh, with the topic, why validation uh, and recognition of prior informal and non-formal learning, which took place on the 13th of October. Just um, click on the option. See, as there almost double the number of uh, registered participants in a way for, for this seminar. So I take it that there will be about 50 50, yes. Um, most of you didn't uh, participate. Okay. Um, to, um, to get rid of this poll result, um, you just you just click on the um, uh, cross and close it. Okay, so there are more people that didn't participate than did participate. Um, just some instructions before we continue. Um, please use the Q&A for questions um, to me, the presenters, and later on the panelists, and uh, use the chat for different kinds of comments. Um, I don't know why I have this problem with, I, there we are. Um, just a quick recap then, uh, for those of you that weren't present during the previous um, seminar, this means a couple of um, minutes of repetition for you that actually were present. Um, this webinar is given in the context of an EU funded project called RPL in Practice. It's funded through the support of the European Commission uh, that the European Commission offers to member states um, for the implementation of a Bologna reform that is creating the European higher education area. Um, the Swedish Minister of Education and Research is the contractor and they have given the Swedish Council uh, for Higher Education the task to, uh, to coordinate the project. And if you follow these two, um, um, internet links, you will find a little bit more information. Um, the, um, the Bologna process and the commission have had a um, focus on peer learning uh, lately. So this is one of those projects. Um, the objective of the project uh, is to promote different ways of recognizing competences uh, for access to further studies and for credits. The objective is to encourage through structured peer learning the participating countries, institutions, to develop quality assured and consistent procedures to recognize non-formal and informal learning that suits the condition of the participating country or uh, institution. And um, the um, participants uh, in the project uh, are uh, agencies, ministries, higher education institution, in five European countries and uh, with uh, Russia. When, when we initiated this project, we wanted to involve countries that were in the process of implementing or developing their validation practices, um, things that were going on in, within these countries. And we also wanted to have um, uh, countries and institutions that were on the different levels of implementation. 
Um, the reason for that is that peer learning is sort of the uh, most important things in, in this project. It's um, peer learning within the participants in the project. But we would, of course, also like to, um, to spread our conclusions and experiences outside the project group. Um, and there is much to learn from one another. Um, in the project, we come from different higher education systems with different laws and regulations, uh, which lead to a variety of challenges. Um, but in the end, there are many basic questions that are, um, that are similar. During the previous seminar on the 13th of October, um, we looked at the question why validation and recognition of prior informal and non-formal learning. Um, the answer why will differ depending on whom you ask. Of course, um, whether you're representing a higher education institution, the Ministry of Education, National Authority, Quality Assurance Agency, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and it may also um, differ depending on what type of higher education institution you, you represent and where in this, within the institution you you work. Um, during the web, uh, previous webinar, we heard some of the views um, from these different kinds of angles on why validation. We presented a survey that we've done uh, within the project uh, concerning the drivers and challenges for RPL. Um, most common mentioned driver was better access to higher education and inclusion. Challenges, uh, most common ones were understanding the RPL procedures and also attitudes within the higher education institution. We had an um, overview um, national context uh, from Austria and Croatia. Um, where they shared some answers from their point of view on why. And uh, one of the, some of the answers were to the question why was to re reduce skills uh, mismatch, um, create flexible learning path, paths, and also contribute to, um, to the social dimension. And we ended the webinar with a panel where these questions were elaborated a little bit further. And um, lifelong learning was one thing that uh, RPL would uh, contribute to concerning, uh, um, that's what the panelists said. Um, it will also contribute to learning outcome based curricula and um, the importance to um, recognize the workplace as the center of learning was also mentioned. The webinar is, um, is published on YouTube and you can uh, find it via this uh, internet link. And I think we will also uh, get it um, in, the, in the chat, the, the link. So, um, but the why question um, boils down to this, um, more or less. That's what we sort of concluded with. Nobody should be required to study something that they already know. Um, in, in the project, um, we have had the, the council recommendations from 2012 as a starting point. Um, we uh, uh, especially used the four phases of validation outlined in the council uh, recommendation and which are further elaborated in the, um, in the CDFOP uh, European guidelines for validation, non-formal and informal learning. Uh, where the four phases are identified as identification, documentation, assessment, and certification. Not, not everything in the CDFOP guidelines um, are, is directly transferable into the higher education um, context and vocabulary. So um, some of the questions in the project has been, um, do the guidelines work for higher education? Do they need to be adopted to higher education needs? Uh, what has to be in place in the different phases, which are the uh, fundamental uh, building blocks in order to implement RPL, and um, what needs to be in place within the different uh, phases. Um, that's what we have focused on in the project. And um, in order to dig deeper into these questions and to have a common focus when we looked at the different phases of validation, we, um, we have developed uh, an assessment template based on the CDFOP guidelines 
and, um, and the key questions uh, mentioned in those guidelines. We have put the key questions into a sort of a matrix, which we have used. Um, the higher education institutions within the project um, were asked to um, fill in the template whilst working with the uh, RPL or a validation um, case. The purpose of that was to have the, have the institutions uh, look at their own practices to see if it was in line with the recommendations in the guidelines. And secondly, to think about different aspects um, in the process in order to extract the fundamental building blocks and for RPL and the most crucial points that need to be uh, in place for the different phases. And um, besides serving as a, as a common focus within the project group, we also want to produce a tested template uh, which other institutions, institutions outside the project can use. The template is it's meant, it's meant to be an instrument for to self-assess their own practice, but it could also serve as a basis for a focused discussion within the institution on the, uh, the issue of RPL. Um, in the project, we will fill in the boxes in this template um, uh, and with what we consider to be the crucial points, some of the challenges we see, and also uh, links to uh, examples. One thing that has been become obvious within this project, uh, well, it was obvious before as well, but um, it's not a, a one size fits all. The different phases and questions in, in, in this template and in the CDFOP guidelines for that matter, uh, make the most sense um, if they are translated into the national or institutional context. When you develop guidelines or templates like this, uh, for the whole sectors, um, they are bound to be quite um, generic uh, or vague, if you like. Um, we will continue working on this um, template. Um, if you have any recommendations or suggestions, we are happy to receive them. Um, you can write about it in in the chat um, if you are if you have good good ideas. Um, to continue, we will. Um, have two more uh, polls. Um, uh, we would like to hear from you um, to answer some two questions, your opinions on two questions. Um, which is the most important point, um, point in order to implement and develop RPL at your higher education institution? And which is the main priority for systematic implementation and development of RPL in higher education at the national level? Uh, to ask, answer these two questions, you need to, to scroll to get to, to question number two. So I will leave you uh, some time to do that. And um, I, um, I can let you know by, by answering this poll, you will also contribute to, uh, to the conclusion of the project. Uh, we are um, interested in your, in your views and we will consider it when we um, finalize the and conclude the project. Okay, so many of you have answered. I will leave you a little bit more time. Um, first question, transparent procedures and guidelines were really high up. The second one, create uniform RPL processes, seems to be the most um, commonly mentioned. <clears throat> okay. I, th I think we, we stop there. I think we've got um, quite good view of, uh, of all of you. I'm sorry if I stopped before you had the possibility to answer, but um, let's see, 39% uh, of you um, mentioned transparent procedures and guidelines as the most important um, thing to Im implement RPL at your higher education institution. Um, and for the other one, it was creating uniform RPL processes within with national guidelines. Okay, thank you for 
participating in the poll. We will actually come back to um, the poll question in, in the panel uh, later on. But now um, we will continue with the practical examples. Um, we have two practical examples with slightly different um, uh, angle, the presentation. We will uh, start with uh, Susanna Boldrino, Head of Academic uh, University Development at uh, Fachhochschule Campus Wien in Austria. And then we will continue uh, with another example. I will introduce Deirdre later. So please, Susanna, if you could uh, start um, your presentation, I will stop share this. And Susanna. Thank you. I share now the, okay. Good, thank you. Yeah. So, thank you for the introduction, Anders. Dear participants, good afternoon. I'm glad to share some experiences with RPL in this webinar. Thank you, Anders, for inviting me today. I will start my presentation with some characteristic of universities of applied sciences. Um, then I will continue with three steps of implementation of RPL in the FA Campus Wien, followed by two examples of recognition of prior learning in our university. This, intro uh, okay. This introduction slide illustrates now the profile of our university very well. We are a multidisciplinary and an open-minded and dynamic organization. And the colors you see, they show our seven academic departments and our diversity. We were founded in 2001, so we still are a young university. At 2001, we offered two degree programs, and now we have 62 bachelor and master study programs. And we are the largest university of applied sciences in Austria with more than 7,000 students. Let me start now with a picture as a symbol for universities of applied sciences as open systems. This illustrates the tight connections that we have with the vocational field, with students and various stakeholders. This system enables the flexible educational pathways the students need in the future. The UAS Studies Act is our legal framework. This law provides the basis for recognition of prior learning. For example, one of the three main objectives in the law is promoting the permeability of the educational system and the professional flexibility of the graduates. Furthermore, the law states that admission to a bachelor is also possible with a relevant professional qualification. So this law was implemented only 27 years ago. In Austria, we have now already 21 universities of applied sciences. And the law refers already to formal, non-formal and informal learning. It says explicitly, specialist knowledge or experience from the job shall be taken into consideration for recognition. So recognition of prior learning is possible for universities of applied sciences from the very beginning. And it is now listed as a criterion within the accreditation procedures. The close connection to the vocational field and the clear legal basis that we have shows that recognition of prior learning is actually inscribed in the DNA of universities of applied sciences. Nevertheless, we are still at the beginning of this process, I have to admit, because we are a very young educational sector. Let me now describe how we at the EFA Campus Wien started to build up our system of RPL. The first step was 
to set up a policy for all types of recognition for the entire university across the seven departments. The policy includes recognition of formal, non-formal and informal learning. But in recent years, the focus has been on recognition of formal learning, I have to admit. Nevertheless, these steps can be used and are being used more and more for all different kinds of recognition. In the process, the roles are clearly defined on the basis of our law. Central roles are the students who are responsible to bring the corresponding documents, the heads of the study programs who make the decisions, the lecturers who recommend acceptance or rejection, and the academic board in case of an escalation. Well, the second step to build up our system of RPL was to foster the understanding of learning outcomes. We understood that the basis for RPL are clearly formulated learning outcomes in the curricula and a common understanding with the vocational field. Well, how did we build up a common understanding? We founded a working group and we started a series of events. Then we provided a curriculum handbook and information sheets on learning outcomes. Furthermore, we continuously advise and support development teams and lecturers. And we bring together degree programs and experts from the vocational field to discuss how will the vocational field be in 2030. In addition, we set up a database to visualize the learning outcomes. Oh, excuse me. After three years, we can state that the meaning of learning outcomes became clear. The shift to competence-centered learning has arrived at the EFA Campus Wien. The third step was to participate now in two projects. One project from the AQ Austria, the Agency for Quality Assurance and Accreditation Austria. And the second one is this Swedish Erasmus Plus project uh, RPL in practice. I would like to specifically mention a survey on RPL that we did in the AQ Austria project and the use of the templates of the RPL in practice project. Both reflected the status of RPL at the FA Campus Wien. We had plenty of positive learnings using the template which we used in an interview setting. That was good. The template stimulated an institutional debate on shared understanding, policies and standards of RPL. The interviews encouraged thinking about the quality and challenges of current processes. And there is so much to learn from individual study programs and their approach to RPL, particularly in light of regulatory differences or subject specific culture, they are very different. And it's so important to listen to RPL decision makers to create broadly accepted RPL policies. And last but not least, curricular design can minimize the risks of RPL. In subsequent semesters, courses and exams should reflect learning outcomes of previous semesters and hence secure RPL. Now I would like to refer to the survey. 22 program directors participated in the survey. One of the first fundamental questions was, are the recognitions of non-formal and informal competences in your study program? Six program directors stated that RPL of non-formal and informal competences for entry is practiced in their study programs. And nine of them claimed to practice RPL for, practice, for credits. Here are some examples in which uh, topics, recognition of non-formal and informal competences has taken place so far. Technical drawing, tax law, project management, process management, quality management, safety specializations, professional internships, laboratory specific subjects, compulsory internships and English. 
RPL is especially practiced in our department administration, economy, safety and politics. And why? Because students have many years of professional experience there and all degree programs are part time. Now I will present two examples. The first one is about the linkage between work experience and the duration of the bachelor social management in early education and care with 180 ECDS. It is a target group specific bachelor for students who worked at least for three years in a child day care facility. The program was developed for all six semesters. Simultaneously, the competences of the work experience were validated together with representatives of the vocational field. It turned out that the entire first semester could be recognized for the respective target group. So students need to fulfill the following entry requirements and can start right away in the second semester. In the blue boxes, you can see the entry requirements in detail. So students have to bring along a higher education entrance qualification or three additional exams at the level of a university examination. In addition, they need to have a qualification examination for kindergarten teachers and they need to prove three years of relevant work experience in a child daycare facility. The second example is about entry to a master program, software design and engineering with entry criteria. The student had a bachelor in legal studies and not in a technical bachelor, but she had extensive working experience as software developer, but no formal technical education. Altogether, 50 specific credits were defined for entry. The students allocated 20 credits of the required 50 by formal learning from her bachelor degree, like scientific writing. From the remaining 30 credits, half of them were recognized as recognition of prior learning from her working experience. And the rest, 15 credits, had to be earned as fresh learning by attending courses in a respective bachelor on software engineering. The positive learnings we had were recognition of prior learning has enabled the student to enter the master program without completing an entire bachelor program on software engineering. The bachelor curriculum of computer science and digital communications with course descriptions and learning outcomes supported identification. And it proved that an oral examination is a very good tool to determine competences. Finally, I would like to sum up our lessons learned so far. Crediting is not primarily a matter of bureaucracy, also many people see it that way. The focus is on joint learning processes for the development and visualization of competences. The learning takes place in a communication process between the participants, including the network partners. And RPL must already be taken into account when designing curricula. It is particularly important to understand that RPL is about individual learning and organizational learning. As a result, RPN enables le flexible learning paths which now refers back to the picture of the open system of universities of applied sciences at the beginning of the presentation. I now end my presentation with the next steps at the FA Campus Wien. Our main objective is, of course, to decrease bureaucracy and to create an understanding what joint learning means. How we will reach this? First of all, we formulate an RPL mission statement, which corresponds to our culture 
as well as handbooks for program directors, students and teachers. Then we will train curriculum development teams. And last but not least, we will provide information for students right away from the very beginning of the student life cycle and in between. Now, at the end, here's my contact data. If something is still open, I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Um, we will um, we will share the uh, presentations later on and you will have that yeah. uh, contact uh, information. So um, we, we will um, uh, keep the questions till, till after Deirdre has talked as well. So um, could we please, um, uh, uh, please welcome uh, Deirdre Gogging, Recognition of Prior Learning and Work-Based Learning Company Advisor at uh, CIT in Ireland. So um, please a very welcome uh, Deirdre. Thank you very much, Andres. Um, so as mentioned, my name is George Goggin and I work in CIT, which is a, a higher education institution in Ireland. And I'm going to present an overview of our RPL practice, uh, which works for us within our institution. So just to introduce where we began with RPL in 1996 as part of an EU project and in 1999 a strategic decision was made at institutional level that RPL would be implemented as a strategic function within the institution. So it has had a central function for over 20 years within CIT. In that time, there's been a lot of change uh, in the policy for RPL that has been implemented in CIT. So you can see here that in 2006, we developed a policy and we've continued to revisit and change that over the years in response, I suppose, to changes in the learner profile, in changes in national requirements from the QQI, and also to reflect changes in thinking at the international level with regard to RPL. In 2021, so the 1st of January, CIT, um, we've merged with another Institute of Technology. So we'll become the Monster Technological University in January 2021. And so we're now looking forward as to what RPL will mean within the technological university context. So it's building and maintaining what we have developed so far. So RPL and CIT, it can be used for entry, non-standard entry or advanced entry. It can be used for credits for modules and exemptions, full awards, minor awards, special purpose awards. So everything essentially um, within the institution. It relates to all mod modules, all programmes, all disciplines at all levels of the framework. So from levels five to eight of the EQF and level six to 10 on the Irish National Framework of Qualifications. We adopt an individual student approach. So any student with prior learning can seek to have their prior learning recognised within the context of a module or a programme within CIT. There has also been groups of learners with similar learner profiles. So we have used a cohort approach where we look at the baseline uh, prior learning of those individuals and it has enabled us to seek entry, advanced entry into programmes or to develop programmes building on the prior learning of that group. RPL informs their interactions with individuals, but also in our conversations with industry and those external to CIT. So we're very proactive in familiarizing those external to CIT as to the opportunity that it can provide for a learner, for an employee, for uh, an employer in looking at upskilling or upqualifying their workforce. RPL is very much embedded in our quality assurance procedures. So it, it runs along our existing procedures for all students and isn't regarded 
as a different assessment method or requiring different quality assurance procedures. A typical application for RPL in CIT consists of three parts, and I'll just bring you through those briefly. First is an extended curriculum vitae. The second is learning outlined against learning outcomes of the module. And the final section is the evidence to support the attainment of that learning. So support, supporting part one and two of an application. So just briefly looking at the curriculum vitae, this is what a learner is typically asked to present, their past employment, current and past employment, their education, third level training, other education, and relevant additional information. So all of their learning counts in an application for RPL in uh, CIT. The learning outlined against the learning outcomes of a module. So in this section, the basis of the application, so a learner can present their prior formal learning and their prior informal and non-formal learning, which would come under the work-based learning. And they present their case against each of the learning outcomes of, the, of a module. Um, and the evidence then, the final section, is contained in a portfolio inventory. And this is where they link their evidence to each of the learning outcomes with the proviso that one piece of evidence could actually be sufficient for more than one learning outcome. So the focus really is on quality rather than quantity when we look at a learning portfolio. In the case of an application for a major award or special purpose or a minor award, then the applicant or the student would present a separate um, portfolio for each module. And especially in the case of uh, the awards that are based on informal and non-formal learning, that learning is graded and it contributes to a classified award. Support in the RPL process in CIT, and this is just the system that we have found has worked for us. So there are a lot of practical supports for students in our RPL system. That includes a student handbook, uh, RPL support through our RPL website, which includes templates, examples, guidance materials, an opportunity to schedule attending a workshop and one-to-one -one sessions and uh, mentoring sessions with a mentor who will guide them through the portfolio development process. Uh, through COVID, though we've all been working remotely, that support has continued for students, which you know is paramount really, um, that they have been able to continue to submit RPLs and to seek recognition for their prior learning. Support in the documentation of learning then, um, the criteria used to admit evidence into the process. So we use learning outcomes, all our modules are structured in terms of learning outcomes. And there's a link here to the database of all the modules and programs in CIT. And this is available to students in advance of them starting studying with CIT. So they can gauge as to whether they have relevant prior learning which they could seek recognition for. The student handbook, as I previously mentioned, and the availability of templates, which help the student to structure their application for uh, recognition. All of the forms are available in, in, as a Word document or a Word template. So it can be adapted by the student to suit their own learning um, environment, their own learning, prior learning that they would like to present. In addition to student supports, we also have a lot of staff supports, which we feel is very important. We have a staff handbook, which guides staff as to what to expect and anticipate in a, an RPL application. We have a precedence database, so we have kept the, the basis of all the applications in CIT on file. Um, we have recorded the basis of the application and the outcome, and also the assessor who would have assessed the application. And that just helps us to, um, 
to, to work with new lecturers or those who may be less familiar with the process. It also helps us with our quality assurance to ensure this consistency in the process and that applications which have similar prior learning are dealt with in the same manner. We also engage in staff development and familiarization of staff with RPL on a one-to-one -one and departmental or faculty basis. And as part of our Masters in Teaching and Learning, which is managed by the Teaching and Learning Unit in CIT, we have a 10 credit Masters module on RPL. The, just on the right hand side here, you can see a number of the areas that we would work with and discuss with staff um, in, in relation to RPL. And I suppose the assessment of prior learning can be one of the more challenging um, questions or, or uh, decisions that an academic staff member would have. Looking at a process or the process that we have, um, I've divided it into RPL for entry or advanced entry and then for exemption. And just I would like to emphasize, I suppose, the importance of the first step for us. And that is when the learner and course academic meet and discuss the basis of someone's prior learning. So where the learner has identified prior learning and feels that they have sufficient prior learning to seek entry or advanced entry into a program in CIT. And they would discuss the reason and the rationale for that with the course academic. And through that discussion, the course academic or head of department or course coordinator would recommend or not recommend that the person would proceed in an RPL application. They may then submit a CV or they may go through an interview process and the course academic may decide to admit or not to admit the person to the programme, or they may also request that a formal mapping process portfolio would be conducted by the learner. This may be um, due to the fact that a lot of their learning is informal and non-formal learning. So in order for the course academic to make an informed decision, they would like to um, see the detail of the learning. The also, uh, another important, I suppose, consideration is that once uh, an application for RPL is approved, then a precedent has been set. So if another learner who presents with similar learning approaches the institution and the precedent exists that another individual was admitted, then the same decision needs to be upheld. Following the mapping process, the learner may be admitted or not admitted, and uh, or the third decision would be entry with deficiencies where they may get partial entry into a stage of the programme, but they need to complete some elements in the conventional way. RPL for exemption and award, and again, um, just to emphasize, I suppose, the first step here, the learner and academic meeting and discussing, if it's based on for prior formal learning, it's very straightforward. They submit the transcript of results, syllabus, exam paper where possible. And that's a very easy and straightforward and with NARIC that um, it's possible to compare qualifications gained outside of the island of Ireland. If it's based on informal and non-formal learning, then the learner would undertake a mapping process and they would prepare their application against the learning outcomes. They would submit it for assessment and then the application would be assessed by the academic. As you can see in the centre there, there's a reference to additional input and that may arise from the learner mentioning some key learning that they have in the initial meeting. However, they failed to include it in their application. So the assessor may request that that additional learning is included. On the assessment, the RPL is, a gra is granted or not granted. And I suppose in our experience, due to the initial step of the learner and the academic meeting and discussing the prior learning and the academic giving permission or not 
to proceed in an RPL application, then we would see very few um, RPLs not being granted. And we, we, I suppose, in one sense, we undertake that step to avoid the situation where an RPL isn't granted as by the learner going through this process, it's counted as an attempt and they then will have to achieve the module conventionally. For those who have been granted an RPL, their exams results are entered in the broadsheet with all other students who have achieved that module. Just to give you a snapshot of RPL in CIT, we celebrated 20 years of RPL last year. And this is a summary of some of the statistics that we would have from a review of the data that we have in, in house. And um, I suppose for me, the most um, notable statistic is in relation to the number of assessors who have engaged with RPL over the past uh, 20 years. So over 500 assessors have engaged with the RPL. So RPL really has spanned the entire institution um, in terms of discipline, but also in terms of levels. We published a, a, a book um, to celebrate the 20 years, and it contains reflections from a European context from students and staff, and a link is available there for anyone who, who uh, may be interested in it. So there are my details. If um, anything uh, is unclear or you would like to get some clarifications on some elements of our process, please um, feel free to contact me there. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Deirdre. Um, that was um, interesting. And uh, thank you also, um, Susanna, for your presentation. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please ask them in the uh, Q&A. Uh, I know that some of you have already uh, posed questions in, in, the, um, in the chat. And um, I, will, um, I will ask you, uh, one question which come, uh, came during Susanna's uh, presentation. Um, that was uh, one to you, Susanna. Um, why do you think uh, there is better options to get a positive RPL decision for credits than for entry into the study program? I suppose that is um, a question on, on the, um, the survey that you made internally. Uh-huh, about the survey. Uh, yes, um, it, yeah. that it's easier to get a positive RPL decision yeah, yeah. for okay. credits than well, for I, entry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I think that both options are quite possible if it is clear which learning outcomes can be referred to. That That is the, the basis for that. The central point is to ensure that the student can follow then um, the lectures. And both options for recognition have their own challenges. But when entering a study program, there is the admission procedure where competences can be well verified. But this often involves a high number of ACTS for entry. And in a study program, on the other hand, the student is already in the system of the uh, university and the lecturers know the person from other courses. So I assume, and I just can assume it now, then this, of course, is an advantage because the work is already known and probably crediting is only for a few credits uh, for a few ACTS. Yeah. This is my answer. I hope I could a answer it, the question. Okay. Now. Yes. Oh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Then there is a question in the chat to you, Deirdre. Uh, that may have been answered a little bit later on during your presentation, but. Um, the question is, is there a possibility for applicants to complement the written portfolio with a mapping interview, or is the purpose of the one-to-one -one meeting uh, more to coach them in writing their application or portfolio? Okay, so um, the process in CIT is the one-to-one the -one meetings are with an RPL mentor, and that is in the preparation of the portfolio. But in the assessment of the portfolio, the academic assessor who is making the academic judgment on whether the prior learning is relevant and sufficient. Um, and 
they may ask to speak with the learner because they may feel that they just need some clarifications. So it's not that the portfolio is the only way that we assess prior learning. It is the most popular way that we use, uh, we assess prior learning. But uh, depending on the discipline, a, um, for uh, music, a performance may be more appropriate. Um, for art, it may be a submission of a lot of um, artistic uh, or art artifacts. So um, our portfolio of work or whatever it is. Um, so very much what is submitted for an application is guided by the discipline. It's guided by the learner as well as and where they have achieved that learning. So, um, and just to ask, answer some of the other questions there, Anders, um, the time the learner has six weeks of the first semester to submit their application for RPL, and the time is dictated by the deadline that they can formally um, withdraw from a module within CIT, but the applications for prior, for entry and advanced entry would be completed prior to them starting the programme within CIT. So. Yes, thank you. There's also a question on, um, on marks. Um, are there marks um, given for the module and uh, entered for the student? And there was another question in the chat also, when there's programmes where there's a tough competition in order to, to enter. Uh, and I suppose that it's connected to the one with with marks or credits. Okay, so uh, grades. Oh, grades, yes. Uh, yeah, there isn't marks for entry. So if somebody submits a, po a portfolio for entry, there's no grading on that. But yes, grades are applied for informal and non-formal. And the assessment is on the prior learning of the individual relevant to the learning outcomes of the module. So how has their prior learning, their informal and non-formal learning, met the learning outcomes of the module? And the grade is based on the learner's learning and not across the, uh, the class. They don't get a class average, for instance, on their prior learning, I think is, is being asked in the question. Um, an appeals, uh, appeals mechanism is built in like everything else. So uh, the same standard, same approach and process applies for RPL. RPL and CIT, I suppose, is seen as just another way of achieving a module or gaining entry. It's not seen as being special or different or uh, anything like that. It's very much embedded and part and parcel of what we do. Um, okay, thank you, Deirdre. Okay, um, thank yes. you. <laughs> um, there are more questions, uh, both in the chat and the Q&A. We will collect them and I hope we can um, uh, redirect them to you so maybe we could get an answer and, and, and um, uh, well, have it with, to, together with all the other um, um, documentation of the, the webinar uh, because we need to um, continue. Uh, this was very, very interesting and I can see from all the questions and, and, and comments that it was, um, what, was, was interesting to, um, to, the, um, to the participants uh, as well and not only to, to me. <laughs> so um, thank you very much uh, Deirdre and Susanna for your uh, participation. Um, now we will um, continue the, um, the webinar with the, with the panel. And um, we, uh, we have a panel consisting of four people, uh, I hope. Uh, I know that three people uh, are, have um, already entered, uh, maybe the fourth one as well. Um, but the uh, basic outline of the panel is that we will let the panelists um, present themselves, give an introductory remark, and we will also open for questions from you. Um, to post the questions to the panel, please use the Q&A. Um, and um, I will also have a couple of questions to the panel. But then to you, dear um, panelists, um, thank you for, um, for accepting being part of, of the panel. Um, 
I um, would like to ask you to present yourself, uh, explain in which way you're involved in RPL, and maybe comment on what you've just heard in the two examples. If there is anything in particular interesting um, that you would like to, to mention or and, and, and elaborate a little bit uh, around. So we'll um, we'll start with uh, with Sylvie. Could you please present yourself? If you put your microphone on. Okay, now you stopped your camera. Excuse me. <laughs> yes. Good. So, th thank you, um, Anders, for inviting me, and thank you to the to our two colleagues, uh, Dante and Savannah, for the wonderful presentation they made. Uh, so, uh, my name is Sylvie Sylvie I'm representing uh, Eurasia, European Association for Higher Education, professional uh, higher education, as an associate uh, expert. Uh, I, um, I'm French, and uh, RPL in France is, uh, is quite a tradition and uh, been existing for long now, since the first uh, RPL uh, concept started in the 1930s with engineering education. Uh, personally, uh, I'm currently retired, but I used to be a, a teacher in business studies with lots of uh, uh, interaction with the labor world, labor market, and uh, I guess that uh, this was uh, an incentive for me to be interested in uh, lifelong learning and uh, RPS. Um, I, uh, I am involved in Eurasia, I've been involved in Eurasia since uh, 2004, and uh, represent Eurasia in um, RPL issues, uh, in uh, different groups, work, RPL working groups at the EU level uh, since uh, 2010. I uh, um, have been, uh, um, I was a Bologna expert in France, and uh, in the Bologna expert team, I had a, a, a focus on lifelong learning and RPL as well, and co-organized uh, peer learning activities with uh, EU uh, Boring Expert peers. That's it for me. I have to be quick. Yeah. Yes, said. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, um, then um, we'll continue with uh, with Mislav. Could you please present yourself and maybe comment on, on the two presentations if you have anything in particular to, to mention, so please. Hi Anders, uh, thank you for calling me to participate in the panel. It's uh, actually coming from uh, Croatia with the uh, level of RPL uh, that we managed so far to develop uh, to actually comment uh, on uh, CIT and, and Austrian examples, but to say that they are inspiring, especially uh, what uh, our colleagues from Ireland did. It's uh, for us a good, uh, I would say, opportunity to learn. Uh, in our case, we started uh, uh, like 10 years ago or so with uh, recognition of certified prior learning uh, linked to some certificates uh, uh, students achieved outside of the formal higher educational system and then actually piloted uh, at the national level and then at the institutional level. Uh, RPL with uh, other approaches which is linked to any other type of learning being either non-formal or informal. Uh, so we uh, do have some experiences, uh, documents and cases which I can later uh, get the, uh, some kind of deeper insight. But, but basically we are lagging behind some other countries uh, started to use this uh, approach uh, earlier because only in 2013, Croatia uh, actually uh, uh, got its national qualifications framework uh, linked to European one. And we are using uh, NQF as an underpinning, uh, underpinning uh, instrument for RPL. So uh, it, it's somehow linked to, to this, uh, these developments. Maybe this is enough for the beginning. 
Okay, thank you. And uh, Pernilla, please uh, introduce yourself and, and comment on the presentation if you have anything in particular to say. So please, Pernilla. Yes. Thank you, Anders. Um, Pernilla is my name. I work at the University of Gothenburg in the west part of Sweden. Uh, and I work as a coordinator for uh, complementary programs for dentists, physicians, uh, nurses, etc., from countries outside the European Union, and also as a coordinator for validation at this uh, at the University of Gothenburg. Um, yes, what can I say? Um, a few years ago, we created a network here in Sweden, uh, or in the west part of Sweden, seven universities. Uh, joined together and uh, we've been working together since then. Mm -hmm. um, today uh, I do a lot of guidance for students, for applicants and also for institutions um, about rights and regulations, what, what, we, what we need to do, what we should do when it comes to uh, recognition of prior learning, etc. Um, what can I say? I, I also, like, like Ms. Love said, it's very inspiring to hear both Susanna and Edward's presentations. And I was thinking, they both mentioned um, the policies and the strategic, um, uh, strategic decisions at different levels. And I think that's very crucial for, for success in this field, to have that kind of backup from, uh, from above, I guess, even though it might be created from, from bottom up also. So I think that's very, very important. And, uh, yeah, inspiring to hear. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Pernilla. And the fourth panelist, um, Mariana, please uh, present yourself. And um, yes, yes, thank you, Anders. My, yes, my name is Mariana Makela, and I work as a principal lecturer at Hagahelia University of Applied Sciences in in Finland. And uh, I would call myself mostly. Like, uh, <laughs> with the uh, denomination of a, a process designer because my work has been to be involved in, in all the processes on, on a departmental level and on the module level and also on the institutional level at our, our institution. So I have been designing processes, I have been uh, mentoring uh, practitioners in RPL and also practicing myself and, and, and I've been writing guidelines and, and being involved in, in this very uh, very pragmatic uh, approaches with RPL and uh, on a national level I am in uh, I work in a national working group of uh, RPL uh, notice network for books and which you some of you might might know um, which is a very very functional uh, forum for uh, cooperation on a national level because we have representatives from uh, vocational education uh, as well as from higher education, and I represent the UAS sector myself. And uh, I would have uh, mostly one comment on the on the presentations. Thank you, Debra and, and Susanna. It was very interesting to hear these examples, and and I was particularly happy to to hear that there was so much emphasis on the intended learning outcomes and on the importance of curriculum design in this whole process because we also see them as very focal points in in the process development and they also have impacts on policies so thank you for that bringing that focus on. yes thank you mariana um i mentioned earlier when we had the polls that we will return to to the answers um in the panel so uh, could we please get the results on the uh, the poll question um on um, which is the most important point in order to implement and develop RPL. Um, you can see here that it was, if we just take this first question, um, transparency procedures and guidelines was the one that were, uh, was mentioned um, the most. And then learning outcomes uh, were mentioned as, um, well, very high up, uh, the ones that, that you mentioned. Um, Mariana, uh, is there anything, uh, Mariana, that you would like to comment on 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 this? You have already touched upon it a little bit. But. Yes, and I think that the first one goes uh, goes together with the with the learning outcomes. Obviously, they are all linked and and enmeshed because it's a it's a global process. But then again, I would see that transparent procedures follow when we have clear learning outcomes, and and they have to be developed at the same time, and and that is a very 
very important part of the process. Thank so you. that it becomes also transparent for the for the learners and yes yes um in the way where that we heard from uh, from CIT where you actually match your your learning towards uh, learning outcomes um Pernilla, do you have anything to, to comment on 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 this uh, well I, I can just um, I'm, I'm happy for the results because that's what we've been talking about for for several years now that the need for uh, national guidelines or and, and national support uh, and, and when we talk about national support, I, th I think that's what we mean. Um, some kind of guidelines that we can follow and, and by that work more uh, alike and have more similar processes in what we're doing. Mm. Uh, that's a little bit what you do in, in the west of Sweden where you cooperate between the universities there um, to have sort of, a, sort of a similar approach to, to RPL. Yes, that's what we're trying to do anyway, yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, um, Sylvie? Yeah, um, I, I um, should say that I'm very happy to see that they want to delivery with presentation because we have very, a very, very similar system in France. And uh, uh, as uh, Delbre demonstrated it, um, there can't be any RPL if there is no learning outcomes. Without learning outcomes, you can't align the learning outlines. And um, that is the, the central point in, uh, in RPL to, to my mind and to my French experience in RPL. And the uh, transfer on procedures and guidelines, uh, of course, are very essential as well, crucial. If they are not Transfer and procedure and guidelines, uh, quality assurance may not be as high as well. So it's, uh, it's all related. Uh, I, I must admit that if I had to answer the poll, I would have answered first learning outcomes oriented curricula and then uh, a transfer and procedure uh, and guidelines. And uh, I would like to add that uh, as to learning outcomes, uh, curricula, oriented curricula, and the design of programs modules and courses in terms of learning outcomes. It's also a strong point in the Bologna process. And uh, since uh, the, the, the Bologna process, we've been uh, um, encouraging, fostering the use of learning outcomes in, uh, in program designing. And it's, it's, it's also very important for um, term applicants uh, for RPL to be able to align uh, their learning from informal and non-formal learning to the learning outcomes of the program design. That, that, that is what makes the system transparent as well. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mislav, do you uh, well, have any? Yeah, I do have a comment because yeah. he, here actually the this transparent procedures and guidelines uh, I at the, at the beginning uh, wasn't very uh, kind of convinced that uh, actually participants uh, uh, think about transparent procedures and guidelines at the national level rather than institutional level. But then when you look at other answers, uh, one would expect that if uh, learning outcomes, which are de facto foundation of uh, most of uh, curricular development these days and hence uh, RPL, if these are uh, put so high with 23%, and then those uh, institutional level elements like commitment and information of the staff and support is put, uh, let's say, uh, rather low, then uh, it seems that uh, these transparent procedures and guidelines are not institutional procedures and guidelines, but probably national, which at the end of day might uh, uh, talk in favor of the rather undeveloped RPL approach uh, with most of uh, uh, participants where maybe we still expect a lot of our national uh, uh, policy makers in order for this uh, approach to be more uh, accepted uh, in our institutions. At least that's how I see this high percentage and how, how I kind of try to uh, explain why uh, uh, these are so high and not those with support and uh, institutional level awareness and so on. 
Yes, thank you. They're sort of all interconnected, all these. Um, I, I think that the transparency procedures and guidelines were referred to within the institution, but it's difficult to know <laughs> what you actually uh, uh, answer. Um, I have uh, one question in, uh, in, in, in the Q&A. Um, if evidence in form of documentation is not available, how or what could, could be evidence instead? Um, I take it that this is a question to the panel. Uh, it sort of relates to, to Deirdre's uh, presentation, I think. But is there any that you would like to comment on, on this? Um, Mariana is. Do you uh, have a... If we are referring to how to demonstrate the uh, learning mm -hmm. outcomes and they achieved achieved learning, so uh, we have uh, established a process which is called demonstration days, and and we also uh, put a lot of emphasis on the on the transparency of uh, of, of demonstration of learning and and all the and on the equality of the. Of, of the of the applicants. So uh, in those demonstration days, uh, we have the all the candidates who are applying for RPL for a certain module or for a certain course, and there is always a, a pre-assignment that has to be submitted to the panel beforehand. And we also have some external uh, um, assessors who very often are alumni of, of from our university or and from from the same program. Uh, in, in the best of scenarios as, as the applicants are. So that means that there is also input and feedback from the, from the industry on, on the uh, value and, and, uh, and, and the successfulness of the, of the evidence. So the evidence itself can be, of, of, there are many types, uh, portfolios, uh, presentations, uh, pitches uh, or pitching and, and also panel discussions discussions across the, the candidates and so forth. We have a very many, uh, a variety of, of ways to demonstrate learning. But what I feel, feel that is uh, of importance is that their uh, assessment process is transparent and the students always know what is to be submitted and how is it going to be uh, assessed and, and the criteria have to be clear and uh, well defined from the very beginning so that there is uh, a clear pathway of the, yeah. of the RPL process. Yeah, transparency is something that we discussed a lot in in the project as well. Um, Miss Love, um, do you um, you would like to comment on this? Uh, um, well, before you start, I would just like to say documentation uh, could be in different ways. I mean, you could also um, maybe that was your intention, but could you also um, uh, describe a little bit what you do with? Um, uh, in relation to uh, to micro credentials or or minor courses and so forth, I believe that it's sort of similar to what Deirdre uh, meant as the the cohort approach that they use. Um, so if you could answer that while you answer on this question as well, please. Okay. In in respect, maybe uh, just a comment on uh, this question from the chat. Actually, I think, or at least it's uh, how I perceive uh, recognition of prior learning. Uh, if uh, really uh, credits are being uh, provided for learning outcomes that are in curriculum in order, in order to get some exemptions or if you use it uh, for access, in any case, actually it's more uh, recognition of uh, uh, knowledge or competence acquired through some kind of learning, even informal, meaning that even if you don't have, at least that's my opinion, even if you don't have uh, good documents to support that you uh, have some kind of competence which you acquired informally or non-formally, uh, if a uh, process of assessment is transparent, then there is a chance for you to show that you are capable of doing something that you possess some learning outcomes. So, so I would say that docu documentation here is maybe a, 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 second, a, a, a secondary position. Uh, knowledge is the, is the essence. And the other thing that you asked uh, is uh, uh, maybe to, to, to say a bit on what we uh, are doing for a number of years because many of uh, our programs are in digital technologies and there are for a number of years some kind of micro-credentials uh, provided by different uh, 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 technology providers like Microsoft, Cisco, Oracle and others. Actually, those are being obtained in control environment in uh, assessment and there are 
kind of other learning outcomes or content which is being assessed, which is publicly available. And uh, actually there is a controlled process. And then uh, what we did at the beginning, we were actually kind of uh, the personalized uh, approach in which we said, okay, if you as a person have certificate certifying after some non-formal uh, learning or after assessment you took in some uh, certification authority or, or center that you possess uh, knowledge and this certificate, then we correlated actually the content of certificate with our learning outcomes in our courses. Roughly in uh, ICT engineering, uh, some four to 5% of our students uh, present some kind of uh, certificate where they get exemption of few learning outcomes Re rarely the whole course sometimes but rarely more often some learning outcomes being building elements of a course and then actually they skip this part of the teaching and skip this part of the assessment because we actually take into consideration what they bring as a micro credential that's pretty much what we do for the past 10 years uh, and it's helping us kind of uh, get more people from the industry in uh, part-time and other uh, setups uh, and programs to join because uh, they could skip part of the of the curriculum. Thank you. And uh, Sylvie, um, this yeah. question about documentation, um, um, if evidence in form of documentation is not available, how or what could be evidence instead? Do you have anything to comment on that? Well, it, it, it sounds difficult to um, to assess if something if you don't have any documentation on it. But uh, the um, uh, the interview part of the assessment exercise may uh, be um, useful if the, the, the applicant is able to uh, demonstrate already that the the knowledge and the the, the, the competencies have been acquired. So the um, yes, I, I think that it, it's very different from one case to another, and uh, it's, the, 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 the documentation is still important. Yes. May I ask also uh, to you, Sylvie? Um, in in France, you have um, uh, a fairly sort of centralized system for for validation, or a little bit more centralized than than in 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 some other countries. Anyway, how? How does that work, and especially in connection to the um, to what we heard about uh, RPL being also a um, something that could con could contribute to the um, learning outcomes based curricula? Sort of the it's like a circle. You 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 have your learning based uh, or learning outcomes based curricula and then you have something to to assess and validation and yeah. and that if that is not in within the same institution but rather uh, uh, centralized is is there a connection could you please yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. well the, the 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 french system sounds probably uh, complex but it's not indeed First, what is centralized is the, um, the, 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 the process, the procedures are centralized and is supervised by the Ministry of Labor. Because in France, recognition of prior learning is very related to the world of work. And uh, uh, of course, it's the, 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 the Ministry of Labor that is uh, supervising the, the, the RPL process, but of course, it is in, uh, in line with all the, the other ministries, and the ministries of education and uh, education as well. So the, the, the process and uh, the, the RPL platform is centralized, it's at a national level. But the institution is free to adapt and to design the, the, the way uh, that the affair uh, will be implemented in, uh, in, uh, in the institution. I'm not sure I'm clear on that, but since they do have processes and procedures and guidelines and tools that are national tools, we all have to use these tools and this process for transparency and building trust 
among all the uh, institutions and educational and training providers. But at institutional level, the, the guidance, the, um, the, the assessment, the validation is organized as, uh, as the program, uh, um, well, according to the needs of the applicants, indeed. But it's, uh, that's it, indeed. It's, it's balanced and it's not, uh, not everything is centralized. Oh, there is okay. still an autonomy within the, the, the universities and the institutions to adapt and to, uh, to, to, to validate and, uh, and recognize the, the outcomes of the applicants. Okay, thank you. So it's more the, um, the organization which is centralized, whereas the actual practice yeah. is done on the institutional exactly. level. Um, Pernilla, uh, with your uh, regional approach that you have uh, in the west of Sweden, um, it's sort of similar. You have a, a regional uh, agreement on approximately the practice and how we should do it and, and, and whatnot, and then you do the... Um, the assessment or, or the actual practice uh, you do at your your own institution. W what was the um, or what is the biggest challenge in in having a regional cooperation in that sense, where you cooperate with some things and then you do some other things yourself? Well, I think um, challenges. I think one thing is the autonomy at the Swedish universities that might be problematic in this sense, since. Uh, uh, you don't really have to follow somebody else, <laughs> really. And, um, and also that there's a lot of people are involved in this process at the different universities in the network. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, uh, it's a challenge to, to keep everybody on the track and, and to, um, uh, to, to think of this as, as important and, and something good that we work together. We can help and we can, um, yeah. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. But in theory, you you accept each other's decisions more or less. In theory, yes, <laughs> we do. <laughs> we have this agreement, and we have also this uh, um, manual and handbook that we created together. So uh, yes, in theory, in theory, definitely, yeah. Mm. That's good, Mariana. There's one thing that. Um, as we don't have any more questions in the Q&A, um, I, I really would like to hear a little bit more from you, Mariana, about the connection you see in um, workplace learning and, and RPL. Because when I look at your website, um, on the website about validation, uh, the validation of formal and also validation of informal and non-formal learning was mentioned all together with what you called uh, work and study. And mm -hmm. this work and study seems to be very interesting, uh, very free in a way. How do you yes. see the connection to RPL and, and how does it work? Yes, actually, I think that we'd uh, rather have to call our system or our approach a recognition of re learning rather than <laughs> recognition of prior learning because yeah, this yeah. work and study process is, is a, uh, an alternative way of, of conducting studies and wh whilst uh, in, in traditional RPL we are dealing with the uh, learning outcomes and, and learning that has been achieved uh, prior to the entrance of the of the higher education institution with work and study we are uh, very much involved with learning that takes place and is conducted at the workplaces uh, and uh, we the connection is that uh, it is uh, it is a learning process that's assessed with the same criteria as the regular learning process would be when the studies are conducted in in the traditional mode and with the same uh, learn, intended learning outcomes and like i said in my in my prior comment on on this uh, assessing panel so we try to have as multi vocal assessment as possible with the peer uh, peer feedback and, and self-reflection and uh, a multi-vocal and multidisciplinary team of assessors but uh, the learning that we are assessing at the, that uh, in that process has been conducted at the workplace and and we try to be very rigorous with the with the quality uh, assurance uh, uh, issues as well and and this uh, and one way to tackle this this challenge is to make an agreement in the beginning of the process so the student uh, maps or, or screens the learning outcomes of the course towards the responsibilities at his or her workplace and the employer 
agrees with the with, with this approach so that actual and, and, and real life documentation can be used like we just discussed before whether there is evidence or not so in this case it, it has been agreed in the beginning that there will be evidence for the workplace and uh, I, I would imagine that this is quite close to the approach what the Derbe and, and, and her colleagues are uh, applying at the CIT. So uh, it is learning that takes place at the workplace when the responsibilities of the learner match the intended learning outcomes of a certain course. So it, it means that not all students can apply to all courses, but for many of our students, uh, among whom the majority works already in the field of their studies, it is a very compatible, uh, the very, uh, how would I say, appealing way of, of conducting part of their studies and, and ha having it validated in, in, in that way. So that is the connection. So recognition of learning rather than RPL. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, then it's very, very similar. <laughs> yeah. but, but just uh, like you said, it may be not prior, but it's the learning mm. when it takes place. Exactly. Mm. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, this has been very, uh, very interesting. And I think we could go on and uh, discuss these things for, uh, um, for much longer. Um, but we, um, it's almost four o'clock and I need a couple of minutes to wrap uh, the, uh, the webinar up. So thank you very much for your participation in, in the panel. Um, very happy that you all could, um, could participate. And uh, maybe we um, will have an opportunity to um, um, to have this discussion in in, in, in another uh, context as well. Uh, I hope so. And uh, for those of you that still have uh, questions to the panel, um, if you uh, if you write in the in the chat, maybe we could forward the questions to to the panelists um, uh, later on. Uh, is that okay with you, panelists? You just nod, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, um, let's um, let's then continue um, for to wrap this up. Um, this, um, like I mentioned, this webinar is is uh, organized within um, the recognition of prior learning in practice project. And uh, we um, we are planning to um, to have a dissemination conference, um, which I would like to promote now. Um, my difficulty is that I can't really give you a date. Um, we uh, we plan for have a, have a conference in the beginning of the spring, uh, but then again with with the pandemic situation that it's not possible. So we are looking at the option of, of having it later on during the spring, because we would like to have it uh, as an in-person uh, event. Uh, even later on in the spring or June could be um, difficult. We, we don't know. So either we have a um, in-person event, uh, maybe in June, or we have a, um, a longer um, um, webinar with more in-depth um, discussions, uh, more time for, for, for you to interact, the audience. So um, the date is not set. Please keep updated uh, by looking at this webpage. It's the uh, webpage of the, um, the project. It's, um, it contains some information. It's, it's, not, um, it's not very informative, but still that's where we will um, um, Put post the news on on where and when the uh, the final dissemination conference is. Um, thank you for participating. Uh, like I said, your uh, contribution uh, in the polls, etc., and also the chat uh, will um, will benefit us in the project, and we will we will use it uh, in our final conclusions. So. Um, Thank you very much for being part of this uh, webinar and uh, I hope to uh, see you again. Okay, thank you and goodbye.